Okay, I think we're ready to start. Thanks for being patient for a minute. There's definitely a lot more material to cover in my other class, and I wish they would have put my two same classes back to back so I wouldn't have to switch over and over again, but this works. It's working. It's okay. I didn't think about that ahead of time. Um, so transforming your food storage into a nutritional powerhouse. Um, the reason why I feel passionately about this subject is that we just don't know what we may be facing when a disaster happens. We know that disasters are on the rise, and from what I've researched, illnesses and diseases run rampant during a disaster as well. And in order to combat that, we need to make sure that our health is intact, that our immune systems are strong, that our elimination systems are staying open, and, and which makes maladies be more treatable. And we're able to use food as um, a way, food or even supplements, as a way to keep our immune system strong and to allow us to be able to respond to stress in a more healthy way. Because most of us know that stress, stress, sorry, I can't talk. Whew, switching everything over. Okay, trying to collect myself. Okay, so stress is one of the number one causes of diseases and illnesses in today's world. It just, it breaks down the digestive system and um, depletes more minerals and nutrients as we're going through a stressful situation. So. Um, and when you think of a disaster, are we going to be under stress? You betcha. We definitely are. So would it be a good idea to make sure that the food that we're putting into our bodies are building up our bodies and building up our immune systems? Definitely. So, um, and there's a variety of ways we can go about doing this. I am not suggesting that we need to totally revamp our whole entire food system, food storage and what we have stored up. That's not my suggestion at all. I have lots of different suggestions that I'm going to make today. So first thing on our handout, and if you don't have one, they're floating around the room somewhere. There's some on this chair up here. Uh, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. I agree with this. I think food is an incredibly powerful tool to make sure that, um, it, and it can be a medicine, a form of medicine. Um, I, to me, it's more like a form of preventative medicine. Um, just because with my story with having had Lyme disease, there is no way I could just eat healthy food and have that heal me. There is no way. What I had was far more aggressive, and what we could potentially have during a disaster is far more aggressive than, you know, to be able to allow us to say, oh, just eat healthy foods. That'll be your medicine. No, no, it needs to be both. But, so it's more of a preventative medicine. Okay, so point number one that I want to make is... Let's think outside the storing of just the basic grains that we're told. We're told, we're told to store wheat. I mean, sorry, we're not told. We're told to store a variety of grains, but mainly we tend to steer towards the most regular grains. We store our wheat and our oats and our rice. And usually that's about, I don't know, that's about as far as we get. But I'm... What my message is, is let's think beyond that. Let's store a variety of grains. Let's realize what these other grains are and how easy they are to get them. And by doing so, we're able to incorporate some more nutrients, different nutrients, into our food storage and um, be able to use those to help, our, help us stay healthy during a disaster. These grains are amaranth, quinoa, oats, spelt, rye, camut, millet, buckwheat, sorghum, brown rice or wild rice, and barley. There are some others outside of that. There's teff and um, some other ones, but those are a little bit harder to come by. I'm talking about the most basic grains that a lot of us have kind of forgotten about. Um, amaranth, and we can pass these around. Amaranth is just a super tiny little, it's actually a seed, not so much a grain, that you can cook up just like you would your rice. You can eat it plain. As a cereal, pour some milk or something over it, add fruits, nuts, whatever to it. Or you can add it to your soups. Really, you can add it to anything, couldn't you? You cook up the grain and you throw it onto your tortillas or your sandwiches even. Who cares? Just, your, just get the grains in your, in your food. Um, and we can pass these around. I'm going to put these right here. Would you mind just grabbing them? And then we can just get these passed around. Um, Quinoa is another one. I don't have a sample of that one. Sorry. This, I actually almost forgot these greens, and my husband ran home and just grabbed. I just said, just grab the greens that we have in our pantry and in our little hutch. Um, so he, he did a good job doing that. Uh, quinoa is a protein-packed seed as well. And um, 
but uh, although people consider a grain, and that's a, one, that's a good one to have stored in our food storage as well. Oats, we all know oats is spelt. Um, that is a great substitute to wheat. Um, I'm going to talk more about wheat in a little bit. There's, um, there's a reason why I don't put wheat on this right here. I think we already have enough of that. Most of us have enough of that stored anyway. Um, spelt is another one. It's, it's very similar to wheat and can be used and made the same way you make wheat. Rye, same thing. Kamut, I love kamut. We actually do not use wheat, we use kamut. And I will explain why in a little bit. But that's similar to, oh, I have some kamut right here. So here's that one right there. You can look at that. It looks a lot like wheat. It's a little bit longer. It has a different color when you grind it up. I actually find it beautiful. I have a silly little story about that. I was grinding up the kamut and I told my husband, I'm like, it just had a different energy, like it was talking to me. It just felt so good. I don't know, compared to wheat, because wheat really is something quite altered and different. And um, I know that's hard for us as LDS members to listen to. And I am just fine if anybody disagrees with me. I'm perfectly fine with that, because we are told that wheat is the staff of life. Um, but our world is a messed up world. So we're, we've messed with the wheat grain far too much. I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, Millet, we have millet. Do you know those bird, the bird seed sticks that the birds peck off of, all the little seeds? That's millet. But millet is meant for us too, not just the birds. This is millet right here. Interestingly enough, millet contains vitamin B16, which isn't found in very many foods, and that is a, an amazing anti-cancer, uh, has amazing anti-cancer properties. Um, so that one's, and you can cook that up just like you would with other grains. Um, Buckwheat is another one. This is buckwheat. Buckwheat is a fun one. You can sprout that one, too. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, we have sorghum. I didn't have any sorghum to bring. Uh, brown rice or wild rice and barley. So you can cook these in a variety of ways. Um, you can throw them into your soups. Um, you, for grains, such the, the grains that look similar to the wheat grain, so rye, wheat, spelt, or kamut, and also barley. I forgot to add that in the notes. Those can just be um, soaked overnight, and then you drain off the soaked water, and you eat it as a cereal in the morning. Just eat it like that. Um, I, had, I used to work at an assisted living home, and so I, would, I'd, I worked there in the evening, and I would make my rounds to all the people in the assisted living home. And there was one man in particular that I made sure that I went to last because he loved to talk. And I love hearing his stories, though. But one thing that I found interesting, interesting is that he said um, one of his favorite breakfast foods was when his mom would soak wheat overnight, um, usually about, it, it depends, 8 to 10 hours. And then um, they, um, they would eat soaked wheat in the morning and pour fresh cream over the top. Oh, he would just revel in that memory. He loved it. And I, I didn't say it to him, but I thought, you know, I don't think he realizes this, but he, um, his mom was increasing the nutritional properties in that wheat by soaking it and allowing it to start growing and making it more easily digestible and make, allowing it, our bodies to be able to assimilate it better by soaking it like that. So I found what he was saying and what his mom did to be really interesting. Yeah? I have a question about the soaking. Um, do you, have, you don't need to soak it in an acid, though? Just no, it just soak it in water. Some people soak it in water with a bit of salt because the salt prohibits any bacteria from forming. There is a slight chance, you, yeah, we'll go over that in a minute when I talk about sprouting and stuff. But yeah, you, I, I haven't heard that, just do water. Like, I try to keep it as simple as possible, just it doesn't need to get extravagant. I, I think I know where you're coming from, and like some people create breads and things that are, or soak their oatmeal, and they say, oh, but you also need to have rye in it because that helps it break it down even more. Just, I'm sorry, but I don't feel like Heavenly Father made things that complicated. I just don't. He isn't that way, to me, in my mind. Um, although some of the things I recommend, maybe you'll think that is complicated. We only eat sourdough bread, and with naturally you have lemon yeast, and that's rather extreme. But I don't know. To me, I find it beautiful and natural. So, okay, anyway, but that's a tangent. Ignore that. Okay, so... <laughs> um, oh, by the way, I need to mention here. So I am creating an ebook. That is that has all this information, everything in it, um, all of the nutritional properties of these grains, um, more about sprouting, just all this stuff that w that is free when you buy the Beyond the Beyond Wheat and Weeds book, the remedy book that I'm making um, by August 30th. So, but 
Um, after August 30th, you can just buy it for like $5. I'm not going to charge a lot. I think this is important information people need to get their hands on. So um, I just get into all of these subjects a lot more in the little ebook that I'm writing. Okay. Um, so you can eat these variety of grains. Uh, let's see. So you can soak it or then you can soak it and sprout it. We're going to talk about sprouting in a minute. Or you can grind it and use it for baking breads or even bread-like substances. I think a lot of us think, you know, we want bread when a disaster happens. Well, if you're one of those people, have at it. Um, but we also need to realize bread can be a really simple substance where you can just put it together with a few simple basic ingredients and fry it up and have a, at least a bread-like substance that we can be eating that's easy to cook. I, bread, cooking bread will be fairly complicated during a disaster, unless if we're really into like solar ovens and things like that, which is fine. I really admire people who are into that, but I just, I just try to keep it as ba basic as possible. For me, you know, there are a lot of people who, and I don't blame these people, but they want to eat the same kind of meals that they're eating today. They want to eat the lasagna and the enchiladas and the, you know, fancy meals. Well, for me, I think, I don't even care about that. I just want to make sure I have food on hand, that we have simple recipes, and that they are as nutritionally packed as possible so that we are staying as healthy as possible during a disaster. Okay, so um, the grains can be purchased. There are lots of different places that you can purchase the grains from. These are just the ones that I've used and that I recommend. Or I recommend them because I know, I know them and I have used them and I know that they provide good quality foods. So Azure Standard, Alpine Food Storage, Emergency Essentials. I personally buy my camu from a man named Greg Hall. He lives out in American Fork. It's either American Fork or Pleasant Grove. Um, uh, they're really affordable and they're basically organic. He's gone out to the farms himself and seen how they grow things. And they're, um, although they don't have the label that says organic, they are basically organic. Uh, the, the whole way they do their, grow their camu, it is organic. So sprouting, this is where we really are able to tap into the nutritional powerhouse in our food storage. I had a sister that came up to me and she said, you know, I have so much wheat in my food storage, but I don't even know what to do with it. And I thought, well, okay. I didn't say anything because I knew she thinks I'm a little wacky sometimes with all my ideas and things that I have going on, but sprouting it is such an amazing way you can use your wheat. Now let me talk a little bit about wheat right now. Um, the reason why I'm not all for wheat is because it has been altered um, enough so that the chromosomes are different within the wheat, the protein and the gluten content within the wheat is higher than it used to be and in my opinion ought to be. It's harder to digest and with how much we Americans are eating wheat it's affecting our digestive systems. There is a massive amount of digestive problems out there. IBS, um, what, I can't even think of any right now. IBS and what are some of the others? Celiac. celiac. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Celiac or even any food allergies. Any allergies, period, is digestive related. Um, our digestive system makes up 70 to 80% of our immune system, so it affects our overall health. And we want to make sure that we're feeding our body foods that are not hard to digest. That being said, though, I'm not saying throw out all your wheat that you've stored in your food storage. I'm saying use it. It's still a good food. We can still eat it. It's still a nutritious substance that will um, um, feed us during a disaster. But we also should keep in mind that we can tap into its, nutri into its nutrition by sprouting it, um, by doing a few simple basic steps, by sprouting it. And when it's sprouted, it breaks down the gluten, it breaks down the protein, and it breaks down something called the phytic acid, which allows it to be more easily digestible for our bodies and, and more easily assimilated, so we're able to take up more of the nutrients than we otherwise would if we just grind it up and turn it into something like bread or such. But for me, it's more like, let's just, can we just slowly steer away from wheat and start using Kamut would be my number one recommendation only because it's most affordable. It's, it hasn't been messed with like the wheat has been. It's, the meat has just been altered, the wheat has been altered far too much. Spelt would be the next one, but it's almost double in price. So raising a family on that is kind of hard. Okay, so there's, oh, there's some really neat studies that have been done about why sprouts are so healthy for us. Um, um, oh yeah, but first of all, so sprouts to me are like having an indoor garden. I, I tend to think, okay, what's the worst situation or worst scenario that we could be dealing with? Um, and we may be in a position where we can't have a garden, either because if we're trying to grow something, people may come and steal the food because 
you know, starvation is abundant and um, everybody's looking for food, or who knows, maybe there be, may be a leak of some kind in the ground, in the soil, and so it isn't safe. I don't know. I still think we should store seeds. I'm not saying we shouldn't. We should store seeds. We should want to have a, a, a garden. But sprouts are like having our indoor garden. We're able to grow things and make them come alive and provide the same type of nutrients that a garden would. And so we have this whole array of, of grains that we're storing. And my sister comes to me and says, I don't know what to do with my wheat. And I just, you know, think, you have no idea what you have here. It really is um, a treasure in our food storage. Um, so a Yale University study of grain, seeds, and beans showed that sprouting substantially increases all B vitamins from 20% to 600%. In fact, I found a study that showed that it can increase up to 2,000%. It really increases dramatically. Um, vitamin E content increases 300% sprouted wheat after four days of sprouting. Sprouts are a complete food. They contain complete proteins and all other essential dietary nutrients along with enzymes to help assimilate them. So when I talk about sprouted foods, I'm not saying this is all that we should be eating. I'm not saying we come and say, okay, family, here's dinner. This, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, I mean, you can't eat it as a breakfast cereal, but what I'm saying is um, you can use it as a supplement, almost like a vitamin supplement. Just um, so sprinkle it onto your different foods. So ways to eat sprouts, eat it as a snack. Fun thing about sprouts is... Um, you know, and during a disaster, I am not picturing, some people like to sprout and then dehydrate their sprouts. I'm picturing just eating it in their soft form, in their fresh So, But what we can do is we can season it. Season it with a bit of um, seasoned salt or even taco seasoning or Cajun seasoning and make it a little bit more palatable as a snack or tossed onto other foods. So you can um, put it in your stir fry, on salads, in tortillas, on pizzas, uh, juice with your veggie juices. Of course, that's not really applying to you know, disaster situations, but put it on top of soups, on top of sandwiches, eat it with your breakfast cereals. <clears throat> okay, and we can pass this around. These, these are uh, Kamut sprouts. They are, they've kind of grown quite a bit, so they look kind of spider-like. Um, in my opinion, I, that isn't the way I'd prefer to eat it. I'd want to eat it where the tail is just starting to grow. It just is more pleasing to the eye and palatable that way. Um, like when I think of handing my kids that and telling them to eat that, you know, that's, they don't like it quite that way. Um, but there are, oh, your paper. I, I passed around a paper that shows all the different types of nuts, seeds, grains, and legumes that you can sprout. So really, it's not just grains, it's your seeds, it's your nuts, it is your legumes that you can be sprouting so that you can have the nutrient that you need for that. And there are instructions on that handout as to how to go about sprouting. So basically, um, did I just? Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, so basically, this is what I recommend people store. Store three to four mason glass jars with the lid and the screw top part, whatever that's called, and a stocking, a little 33 cent stocking. Uh huh. And the reason why is because um, in order to create sprouts, you, it has to go through a three to four ish day process. So first you fill the jar with the appropriate amount of grains, and then you fill the jar with water and allow it to sit like that. Usually I do it overnight, so I do it before I go to bed. So it sits overnight soaking. The next morning you take off the lid and put the stocking over it and screw the screw part back on and drain out the water and then add some more water in there to rinse it off, just give it a rinse and drain out that water again. And then you set the jar tilted on its side uh, so that any w extra water can come out. If you have stagnant water sitting in there in the bottom, if it's upright and there's just stagnant water in there, it'll rot, it'll, it'll go rotten. So you just tip it on its side, keeping the stocking in place. And um, the next day, you, you rinse it twice a day. So morning and night then you rinse, go through that process again. And it just grows and grows and turns into a wonderful food for you and your family. So that's the most simple way. There are, um, there are products out there that you can buy, these cute little systems, sprouting systems. But for me, I'm just like, okay, if we want to keep it as basic as possible and as inexpensive as possible, let's, let's just get a jar and get a stocking and have the instructions next to it so you know how to do it and which ones you can sprout and how long it takes and, and stuff. Um, yeah, rinsing it is important because there are bad bacteria that can grow in it. So rinsing is absolutely um, essential. Uh, quick yes. So would you do the salt thing with the sprouts that you were saying? You can. See, the salt would prohibit bacteria from growing, so you can. 
Um, there, it's yeah, it says on the instructions that, that you can put salt in there as an option, although it's not absolutely essential. Oh, thank you. Ty brought me water, too. My mouth is a little dry, thanks. Mm. Okay, I think that's it. So, and um, let me think. Okay, so upgrading our foods. Now, when I say upgrading, I'm not saying toss out what you have. I'm saying consider, instead of... Uh, instead of storing some of these usual foods, consider adding or upgrading to something that's more nutritional, that's the same type of food. So, for example, white rice. Consider storing brown rice um, or wild rice because they have more fiber and more nutrition. White sugar. Consider, um, consider storing raw sugar or a sh a pure cane sugar called sucanat or rapadura. The sucanat and rapadura especially are... Um, packed with minerals. Salt. This is kind of a big one for me, only because I know how important minerals are for the body. Um, salt. Consider um, start um, upgrading to sea salt or Celtic salt, because those are packed in minerals, super packed in minerals, um, compared to the store that just the normal table salt. Mm -hmm. Um, Redmond, that, Redmond is the sea salt that I buy, so you can buy it from them. I actually buy the, um, I get the bulk, uh, at Good Food, not Good Foods, at Good Earth, there's a bulk food section where you can buy all sorts of grains and just bag them yourself. They have Redmond, I don't know if it, it is Redmond, but it's sea salt. I'm pretty sure it is Redmond. Redmond sea salt back there that you can bag, but otherwise, um, these places that I, like Alpine, Azure Standard for sure sells these. Um, and I don't know, you can look around and see where you can buy those. Yes? How does kosher salt compare? I have sea salt and kosher salt. I don't know much about kosher salt. I'm sorry, I don't know. I haven't seen Celtic salt. Yeah, Celtic salt, it actually has more minerals than sea salt does. But it's, to me, it's just not as practical to use in meals. But I give that suggestion just because I know that it is so packed in minerals. So just if you, yeah. And in the book, I'm, I'm going to research and look up uh, resources as to where you can get these. And I'll have that in the ebook. Um, this is, yeah, I still need to research that some more besides just giving the normal resources that I know about. So with oils, most of us, you know, use canola oil or soybean-based oils. Um, please, <laughs> can I just say please? Please move up to olive oil, coconut oil, and grapeseed oil. Uh, I, um, Let's see, what am I thinking of? Costco. They sell coconut oil, a really good coconut oil. A big tub of it, 20 bucks. That one's really good. Um, grapeseed oil, you can get that from Walmart or Good Earth. Uh, extra virgin olive oil, you can get that in most any grocery store as well. Uh, wheat, consider using or upgrading to camu or spelt. Uh, canned fruits and veggies, I am not trying to imply here do not, do not store canned fruits and veggies because eating any fruits or veggies will be good. Um, but dried fruits and vegetables have more nutrients than canned ones do. When you can fruits and vegetables, you're using high heat, high pressurized, uh, high temperatures and high pressure, and that depletes a lot of the nutrients. Um, not all of them, but it does deplete some of the nutrients, especially vitamin C, the vitamin Bs, and vitamin E, and including the enzymes that are in the fruits. So um, by drying them, some of the nutrients are depleted, but not as much. So that's just kind of something to keep in mind. Honey, there's a huge difference between raw honey and pasteurized honey. Here's a little handout you guys can pass around. Ooh, it's, and it shows that on the paper that I'm sending around. It shows, okay, this one has high fructose corn syrup. The pasteurized kind does. I mean, not that I'm saying all of them do, but most of them do. Okay, so with honey, um, there's a huge difference between raw honey and um, just regular pasteurized cheap honey that you would buy in the store. Um, there are more nutrients in the raw honey, the enzymes are intact in the raw honey, and it becomes a medicinal uh, food. Um, it's antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal. And that is not the case with pasteurized honey. Um, so uh, let's see, I wonder, no I didn't. Okay, so you can look around at that paper and see kind of the difference. There's this fun little checkoff list as to the difference between the two of them. Um, so nutritionally dense foods, the next recommendation that I would have was is just store 
some foods that are considered superfoods that are so nutritionally packed just as a supplement, not as like you're digging into it and eating a ton of it every day, just as a supplement. Um, so one of these is bee pollen. I have a little paper. Oh, you know what? I have samples. You guys get to try bee pollen and goji berries today. Woohoo! How many of there are you? Does somebody want to do this for me so I don't have to sit here and do this? <laughs> Any volunteers? Okay, I'll put it on the table over here. Just sprinkle a few, just a little bit of the bee pollen and maybe like, yeah. So maybe like three, I don't know, three goji berries for each one or something. Okay. So bee pollen, oh, I have a paper. So pass this around. You can read about the bee pollen a little bit more on this paper. Yes, which is actually one good reason why you use honey when you make breads because it helps break down the... What, what does it even help break down? I was trying to explain that the other day. I'm like, I know I've read it in the past. Do you know what it is exactly? Yeah, I don't know either. But it helps you digest the bread more easily when you use honey, either on it or using it in the bread. Yes, I love it. That's the enzymes going at it. Okay. So bee pollen is one of them that I recommend storing. You can buy the bee pollen for, from Good Earth. I bought that. That, is, that amount right there was worth, it was like $9 worth. You can buy a bigger one. That's, um, anyway, uh, bee pollen is the most complete superfood found in nature. It contains vitamin B9 and all 22 essential amino acids, all 22. And it's a rich source of complete protein. It increases strength, endurance, and speed. And B vitamins, the B vitamins in it, um, builds up our stress defense shield and increases longevity. To me, you know, I just feel like keeping, we need to keep in mind that we will be under a lot of stress were a disaster to happen. And we need to be um, supporting our body so that we can handle that stress more easily. And I think bee pollen is just a great little supplement to have on the side to help us along with that. Um, the next one on the list is goji berries. So the goji berries are known to be one of the most nutritious berries on the planet. Um, it's packed in vitamins and minerals. And um, let's see, it's a complete protein source, contains 19 amino acids, um, has all eight essential amino acids, uh, 20 or more trace minerals, also B1, B2, B6, and E. So it's just like, just have a few bags of these in your food storage. That's not very hard. They are kind of expensive. I think this bag was about $14, I want to say. But have a, just keep just a few bags in your food storage, just as a nutritious little snack that just once or twice a day you can go to and eat. Okay, the next one. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't know why I put green powder mix. I think it's because I have a list of green powder mix recommendations that I, that I have. But I want to tell you about, well, first of all, have you guys ever seen the green powder mixes in the store? Do you know what I'm talking about? Where people, they dry, they grow and dry like alfalfa alpha or wheatgrass or what are some of the other ones? A kale, even any, any dark leafy greens, they take them, dry them, and turn them into a powder. And you can add those to your smoothies, or you can just mix it into water and drink it that way. Well, I have come across this, um, this particular green powder. It's called Moringa. It's from the Moringa plant. And the Moringa plant is also nicknamed the tree of life or the miracle tree. It grows only in third world countries, which I find absolutely fascinating. It's a fast growing plant that is incredibly nutritious. You can use the leaves, the bark, the roots, all for um, nutritional and medicinal properties or nutritional, uh, what, what, as a nutritional supplement and for medicinal uh, uses. Um, to me, this increases, it just strengthens my testimony about Heavenly Father and how much he loves us. He knows where the poverty-stricken people are, where the most malnourished people are, and they, he planted one of the most amazing plants in their land so that it can help them. Um, more and more people are starting to supplement with the Moringa plant in these third world countries, just adding it to their foods, this green powder to their foods, to give them the nutrients that they need to survive and thrive um, on a daily basis. And they've had some remarkable results with that. So I, what I did 
is I took this Moringa powder and I thought, okay, how does this compare to kale? Isn't kale known as like the super food? It is like the leafy green that you want to turn to and eat and, and get the most nutrition from. And then I also compared it to, um, so I compared it to kale powder and then all the other um, green powders out there, green powder supplements out there. And this is, has more than any of them, any of them. And it's just from one simple um, um, tree. And the amazing thing is, is that one serving size for an adult is half a teaspoon. There's 226 servings in here. You really don't need a lot. Um, I saw a video where um, some third world, some poverty stricken people were just sprinkling it on their sandwiches or, or their porridges that they were eating. It does taste like a plant. It's green leaf. It doesn't taste all that great, but um, really, I actually drink it every day. I love it. Um, you get used to it quickly because you feel the difference that it makes in your body as you're giving your body what it needs to survive and thrive on a daily basis, and then you kind of start craving it, which I do now. But um, just having a can or two or three of these in your food storage is just really beneficial. It will, it will, it will bless you and your family if you have that. I'll just say that. Well, yes. That. Moringa, yeah, M O R. I-N-G-A. It's in the handout. Oh, yeah, it's in the handout. Yeah, and um, you can buy this from Good Earth. Yeah, um, I would just, I would, I would suggest to make sure it's organic. Just, I've seen some videos on, I don't know, people making them. and they're, These are made in third world countries, and the conditions may not be that great that they're made under, but um, if, you're, if you're getting one that's certified organic, I think you're pretty safe in knowing that it's a nice, clean, well-made uh, powder. The next one is maca powder. Um, whenever, like with the remedies, you know, I teach the remedy class, when I, whenever I'm listing what remedies I recommend to people, I pray to Heavenly Father what it is that, what are the most important supplements or remedies or what be it that I need to be sharing with others and the maca powder was one of them. Um, it, um, I, I still need to find out the exact details of what it is and what it does exactly. It'll be in the ebook, but I just knew that that was one that I needed to incorporate in there. It, I know that it increases our stamina and our energy levels and maybe that's why, I don't know, I still have yet to find the treasures to why Heavenly Father told me to list this one on here. Um, I listed this tea mix, so we already talked about the Moringa. Oh, but first I just wanted to say, okay, so I talked about the Moringa, but next best would be, you know, just get some kale from the store or grow it in your backyard and dry it and turn that into a powder. If you don't want to spend the money on this, take a cheaper option. I mean, it's a more laborious option, but it takes more work. But um, even just having that is really important too. Um, or just buy any green powder drink there just as a good, um, but of course, I have my reasons for recommending that one. Um, so the tea mix, um, a few years back, three or four years ago, I studied what the, what the nutritional content is in teas, like loose herbs. And I took the, let's see, six most nutritionally packed herbs and combined them together so that it would complete as, it would, it would, um, so that collectively it would create a very nutritionally sound and um, nutritionally dense tea. Not that, not that you could get the same as this, but just imagine that you've created a tea with this little mixture here and um, you're just sipping away at it. It just fortifies the body and just continually um, helps give your cells what they need to work right. Um, so that one's just kind of a little fun one that I keep in my food storage that I suggest to people. So runners up would be aloe vera, hemp seed, raw cacao, and spirulina. So you can get those if you want to. There are some neat superfoods out there that we can incorporate into our Adding supplements. Um, of course, I would also just recommend that you add just a normal, oh, I thought I had it, just a good multivitamin and um, liquid minerals. Liquid minerals is incredibly important because our mineral, our bodies need minerals to thrive and work right. And taking a simple mineral supplement uh, may be a good idea, especially when things get pretty severe. Um, on, on the site, beyondweightandweeds.com, you can sign up for my newsletter. I'm not, you know, so, there are some bloggers out there that are so amazing. They send 
newsletters like every week or something. I'm sorry, I'm not like that. If you sign, if sign up for my newsletter and you'll get sporadic information that I've either come across or updates to anything or I don't know whether I email out the handouts or I don't know. I'll just be sending out information. I don't. So if you want to, you can sign up there and you can cancel if you want to. If I get too crazy sending stuff, although I probably won't. Okay, so cooking tools. So. Um, I like to keep things as simple and as basic as possible. I know that there are a lot of really neat like solar oven um, ovens out there that you can use and all sorts of different rocket uh, ovens and, and things that you can use. But this is what I use, so I just tell people, okay, this is what I've come across. I found it really neat. I find it really simple. And so I just wanted to share it with you. Um, so this is a... Indoor propane cooker, not propane, sorry, because it uses butane. What would you call this, John? Butane, a butane cooker, though? I don't even know what the exact label is of these. Butane stove, thank you. An indoor butane stove. This is the, um, the fuel that you use. This is butane in a can here. It's important to know, don't ever cook with propane in your house. Yes. Only cook with butane, because propane puts off too much carbon dioxide. Thank you. Yeah, that's why you, yeah, this, this is why you want to use the butane and the indoor, indoor cooker. Uh, SaratogaJacks.com. And sometimes Macy's sells them in their food storage section. I read somewhere that it can last three hours or more. I think it depends on whether you've got it on high or low. It's not a lot. But that's, I know, that's, but you're exactly right. It's not a lot of time, and I've figured out what you can do to reduce that time. So, you know, this is your stove. I've got a can in here, and I'm locking it and turning it on, and bam, you have a way to cook. This is $20. 20 This. The stove? Yeah, the stove. These are about $1.60 to $2 per bottle, you know? Yeah. Okay, so saratogajacks.com. And, yes. I know, I don't blame you, but really, the chances of that happening are really, really, really slim. Yeah, so, so, how much time do I have? I keep going, I'm out. This, this sucks. <laughs> okay, so this is the last thing, this is the last thing. So, um, the next thing that is really valuable to have is this thermal cooker. So, you put this on your butane stove. Uh, turn it on, just get it to a boiling point. So you're only cooking it for how long? 10, 15 minutes? Get it to a boiling point, put it back in your thermal cooker, place the lid on it, close it, and it cooks by itself. And it'll be done in six to eight, sometimes 10 hours, depending on what you're cooking. So you hardly have to use any of this. You just have a way to heat your food and then get it cooking on its own. That's amazing to me. Saratoga Jacks. Yeah, they're actually based, they're actually out of Utah. I think they're in Saratoga Springs. They are. Yeah, they're, okay, that one closed, there we go. Okay, and the last thing, you know, people always talk about making all these uh, ovens out back. Just buy these very basic cinder blocks and create your own little oven, and there's a link there on how to do it. So that's the most uh, affordable and easy way to go about doing that. So, yes, bringing it to a boil, and you're leaving the water and everything in there still. Yeah, so it's, it's the water, it's, it being in the boiled water and then trapping trapping that high temperature like that so it just slowly cooks away. Oh yeah yeah yeah. And right. Yeah. And I'll have more instructions to that in the in the ebook and the whatever I send you. <laughs> okay. It'll be a little while though. It'll be a little while before I send that out, though. We're going on vacation next week. A very much needed vacation. Yes, good. Perfect. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Hope you enjoyed your little goji berries and bee pollen. What do you do with those goji berries? you put them in muffins or do you just eat them raw? I, would, I personally wouldn't cook them because you're depleting some of the nutrients and the enzymes in them by doing that. I would eat it as a snack or put it in your breakfast cereal or oatmeal or... Whatever. I don't know. How about the bee pollen? Sprinkle it on salads in any of your foods. You can eat it plain. You can even put it in little capsules if you hate the taste of it. Um, yeah, any way you can think of. 
And a normal, the bee pollen, a normal dosage for an adult is one teaspoon, half teaspoon for a child. But they do say to work up slowly to that because it... No, it just can cause a healing reaction. So you may be detoxing. Yeah, if you're allergic to honey or, or so don't use bee pollen.